Good morning. The Committee on Homeland Security Subcommittee on Counterterrorism Intelligence will come to order. The subcommittee is meeting today to hear testimony from the Department of Homeland Security regarding counterintelligence and insider threat programs. I would like to uh, welcome my good friend, Mr. Mr. Higgins, ranking member of the subcommittee, and express my appreciation to the witnesses who are here today on this vital topic. I also want to uh, express my appreciation for your flexibility. As you know, we had to adjourn this, uh, uh, postpone this meeting from its previously scheduled date, and I really appreciate you uh, accommodating our schedule, so thank you very much. Uh, at the outset of today's hearing, I want to stress that the subject matter is sensitive, and after consultation with the ranking member in the department, I will move to close the hearing at some point after the public statements and some initial questions. We will reconvene in a classified setting to continue the hearing. Uh, to that end, I, uh, if other members arrive before we uh, uh, move the hearing, I'd ask them to uh, consider their questions and reserve any that are sensitive for the closed portion. Now, as far as my opening statement, today we find our nation confronting a complex external threat picture that ranges from ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and its affiliates to traditional foes such as Russia, Iran, and China. Earlier this year, General Clapper, the Director of National Intelligence, said, quote, unpredictable instability has become the new normal, and this trend will continue for the foreseeable future. Compounding this danger, there have been a series of appalling events over recent years involving trusted individuals working inside our government who damaged national security or committed tragic acts of violence. Foreign intelligence services and transnational criminal organizations dedicate years of time and financial resources to develop an asset with the access that an insider like Bradley Manning, Edward Snowden, Orla James, and Robert Hansen possess. Information illegally released by WikiLeaks and Snowden's treacherous acts highlight the link between counterintelligence and the need to spot insider threats before they cause grave risk to national security and put lives at risk. The Department of Homeland Security has recently experienced a number of troubling cases where trusted insiders have carried out violent acts or have been arrested for having unauthorized weapons at work. A DHS employee was arrested in early June when he found carrying a gun uh, was found carrying a gun inside DHS headquarters. I know the case is ongoing and the individual's intent is not known, but the case does raise serious questions. Uh, the public court documents definitely raise concerns that he may have contended to, quote, commit an act of uh, workplace violence. Yesterday, there was another case at DHS headquarters where a contractor was discovered with a gun. If reports are accurate, this is the second case in a little over a month of employees discovered through random checks with weapons. I know the witnesses will agree this requires immediate attention by the department to protect its uh, workforce. And in May, an officer with the Federal Protective Service System uh, murdered his wife and several other people. The subcommittee is holding this hearing to review DHS's counter intel and insider threat programs with over 100,000 employees holding security clearances and significant responsibilities for the country's border, cyber, and maritime security, DHS represents a prime target for the intelligence collection efforts of our enemies. Unauthorized disclosures of classified information, whether deliberate or unwitting, represent a significant threat to national security. The very nature of modern communications and the reliance on electronic data st storage and transfer, as well as DHS information sharing leadership role with state, local, and tribal partners, adds complexity to the challenge and requires thoughtful programs to educate employees to mitigate the threat. The subcommittee wants to hear how the department is developing robust and holistic counterintelligence and insider threat programs to defend against threats both virtual and physical. We also seek to examine the partnership DHS has developed within the agency and across the government to leverage best practices. We must determine what actions the department can take to prevent these threats by proactively identifying and intervening when necessary to protect DHS, its workforce, and the country. And I want to thank our distinguished panel for being here today. Uh, your input is very valuable in showing the benefits of strong counterintel and inside threat programs extend beyond DHS, but to the workforce as well by preserving security and safety and allowing DHS to fulfill its vital homeland security mission. And with that, I recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Higgins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank Chairman King for holding this hearing. 
I would also like to thank the witnesses for participating in today's hearing. Many of the issues that come before this committee uh, are and have been mainstays in the public discourse since the terrorist attacks of September 11th. However, the security clearance process and protection of our classified networks and information arguably did not become permanently affixed to our national and international security conversations until May 2013. That is when we learned that former NSA contractor Edward Snowden leaked the details of program, uh, classified <coughs> programs to the British newspaper The Guardian. The sheer volume of the information shared by Snowden brought many issues to the forefront of our national security conversations. Since the leak, Congress and the public have questioned if an outside contractor should have vetted his security clearance or it is, uh, was a duty that should have uh, rested squarely with the hands of the federal employees. We have questioned if Snowden should have had access to such sensitive information in massive volumes. Then, later that same year, we learned that the same firm that vetted Edward Snowden also vetted the Navy Yard shooter Alex Alexis. On September 16, 2013, Alexis, a civilian contractor, opened fire at uh, Navy Yard here in Washington, D.C., literally within walking distance of where we sit today. In the subsequent investigation, we learned that Alexis failed to disclose information about felony charges, and a federal personnel uh, report had no information about his previous arrests. In May of this year, a Federal Protection Service uh, services employee, Officer Tordell, uh, who had held a TS and SCI clearance since November 2015, shot and killed his estranged wife outside a high school in Maryland, then later killed two more people outside a mall and grocery store in Maryland. All of these incidences have raised concerns that we will discuss today. Had a strong uh, insider uh, threat program been in place, NSA authorities would have been alerted to massive amounts of information being transferred by Snowden for public distribution. Continuous evaluations of Aaron Alexis may have flagged his arrest and felony charges. While I understand the limitations of insider threat and counterintelligence programs, I also see the value in having such programs. Today, I also look forward to expanding the conversation to consider the role uh, right to privacy plays in these programs and securing the country. Finding this balance is difficult, but today I, I hope to learn what the Department of Homeland Security is doing to advance their insider threat and counterintelligence programs. I look forward to the robust discussion with our witnesses today, and I yield back. I uh, thank the rank ranking member and uh, any other members of the uh, uh, subcommittee, uh, whether here or not, they uh, may submit statements for the record. We please have a very distinguished panel of witnesses before us today on this vital topic, and all the witnesses remind their written testimony will be submitted for the record, and we will hear first from Under Secretary Frank Taylor. Uh, the Honorable uh, Frank Taylor uh, has served as the Under Secretary for Intelligence and Analysis and as the Chief Intelligence Officer for the Department since April uh, 2014. Prior to uh, joining DHS, uh, Secretary Taylor served with great distinction in the U.S. military for 31 years, rising to the rank of Brigadier General. He's also served in numerous senior positions in the State Department, focused on counterterrorism and security of U.S. personnel, and he's also worked in the private sector. And most importantly, of course, he holds a bachelor's and master's degree from the University of Notre Dame. Go Irish. I now recognize General Taylor. Thank you, Chairman uh, King, Ranking Member Higgins. Uh, I would start with Go Irish. Uh, in our, um, given our shared lineage uh, with the University of Notre Dame. I want to thank you and the members of the committee uh, for the opportunity to appear uh, with my colleagues here today. The department faces a range of threats from foreign intelligence services, non-state uh, entities like terrorist groups and transnational criminal organizations and insider threats. Based on overt intent, capabilities, and broad operational scope, Russia and China continue to be the leading state intelligence threats to the United States and our interests, including the Department of Homeland Security. Similar to foreign intelligence threats, terrorist groups and TCOs continue to enhance their human, technical, and cyber intelligence capabilities, recruiting human sources conduct and conducting physical and technical surveillance of DHS operations. 
Additionally, we are very concerned that the threat from insiders disclosing sensitive U.S. government information will also continue. As the Department's counterintelligence executive, I am leading the implementation of the new national counterterrorism counterintelligence strategy and building out a unified Department counterintelligence program. I'm also the Department's senior information sharing and safeguarding executive responsible for overseeing all classified information safeguarding efforts in our department. We recently completed a classified assessment of foreign intelligence threats to the department and, broader, and the broader Homeland Security enterprise. This will serve as our baseline assessment and we will reevaluate this assessment every year to track trends and update it uh, with significant changes in the CI threat environment. Thanks to Congress, congressional support, we've significantly enhanced our counterintelligence and threat programs. INA's counterintelligence division has department-wide responsibilities. Our objectives are to deepen our understanding of the external and internal threats, de deter, detect, and disrupt these threats, safeguard sensitive information from exploitation, and to protect our nation's networks from foreign intelligence threats such as the disruption, exploitation, or theft of sensitive information, including personally identifiable information. We are embedding counterintelligence officers in each of the department's operational components and within the department's most, most at risk, <coughs> excuse me, headquarters components. We're also leveraging the existing resources like the U.S. Coast Guard Counterintelligence Service and are partnering with CI personnel from across the federal government to enhance the department's CI program. These are just a few of the steps we are taking to meet these threats so the department can continue its work securing the country and fulfilling our border security, immigration, travel security, and other homeland security missions. Our insider threat program has made great progress implementing Executive Order 13587. For this fiscal year, our technical monitoring solution audited 33 million actions on our enterprise classified networks. Of these, 215,000 required manual review by our analysts, of which 72 required further investigation. During the previous two fiscal years, the Insider Threat Program also identified 162 violations and provided support to 15 counterintelligence and internal security investigations. Chairman King, Ranking Member Higgins, members of the committee, thank you again for the opportunity to appear before you uh, to have this very important discussion. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, General. Thank you really for the outstanding job you've done and the dedication you've shown to this job. It really, really is it's very much appreciated. Uh, Colonel McComb, uh, was appointed to the position of Chief Security Officer for the U.S. Department of Homeland Security just over three months ago on April 3rd, 2016. Most recently, he served as the Director of the Least Facilities Protection Directorate at the Pentagon Force Protection Agency. Colonel McComb served over 27 years in the United States Air Force as a Security Forces Officer from which he retired as a Colonel. Privileged to have you here today and you recognize for your testimony. Chairman King, Ranking Member Higgins, good morning and thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony on the Department of Homeland Security's Insider Threat Program. <clears throat> I have the opportunity to lead the dedicated men and women who make up the Office of Chief Security Officer. My office is an element under the Department's Management Directorate and I report to the Undersecretary for Management, Mr. Russ Dio. However, in my capacity as a Senior Insider Threat Official for the Department of Homeland Security under the provisions of Executive Order 13587, I execute the Insider Threat Program on behalf of and under the guidance and direction of uh, Undersecretary uh, Frank Taylor as the uh, Undersecretary for Intelligence and Analysis. As the Chief Security Officer, I'm responsible for DHS-wide related programs affecting more than the 235,000 employees that make up the department, including the areas of personal security, physical security, investigations, administrative security, identity management, special access programs, security training awareness, and the department's insider threat program. Finally, I serve as the chairman for the department's chief security officer council and have an opportunity to, to uh, lead with my other counterparts in the DHS components to lead a highly collaborative uh, security program 
that is designed to safeguard the department's people, property, and information. The DHS Insider Threat Program seeks to deter, 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 detect, and mitigate threats posed by trusted insiders. The program uses technology that is generally called user activity monitoring. This technology puts effective capability behind the warning banners which for years have told users they were being subject to such monitoring. The detection thresholds are tailorable to specific types of users and to specific types of behaviors. This is important that for the first time, the activity of tens of thousands of users on IT systems can actually be monitored via automation and when combined with information from other data sources present a total threat picture. When automated, analysis is added in. The software can alert analysts to the events that have a high threat potential and min minimize wasteful false positives. While this technology is critical, a critical facet of our program, it also relies on aggressive training and awareness for the workforce to enable and empower them to recognize aberrant behavior and uh, the, to include the tools to responsibly port it when they see something. I want to emphasize that the Insider Threat Program is part of the security continuum, one of elements in a series of steps and programs to mitigate the full spectrum of risk posed by employees, contractors, and other officials affiliated with the DHS, as well as external actors who may threaten the department from, from outside. As presently structured, our Insider Threat Program focuses on the protection of classified information as it was originally driven by the Manning and Snowden cases. However, DHS, as well as DOD and the intelligence community are taking a more expansive view of the threat to include workplace violence, fraud, waste, and abuse, and other potential work workforce corruption. The Office of the Chief Security Officer and the authorities exercised by it uniquely situate the organization to execute this program, connect the necessary dots, and detect and prevent such threats. DHS is currently monitoring two of three IT systems. We are in the process of ensuring that our Insider Threat Training Awareness Program meets 508 compliance to ensure accessibility by those with disabilities. Once completed, this training will be posted on our performance and learning management system to enable workforce to meet the initial and annual training requirements. As was indicated earlier, resources are key to the maturation of this program. Currently, we are learning what we can expect from uh, what we can expect to discover on classified systems, but unclassified systems will, prevent, will uh, present much broader risk with far more users and will require greater analysis and follow, follow on investigative capabilities. We have programs uh, for funding in support of this expansive expansion consistent with the current proposed insider threat legislation. In conclusion, access, to, uh, access control to federal facilities, information by federal employees and contractors, and a safe, secure workplace are departmental priorities and one in which the Office of Chief Security Officer has made significant progress. However, there's more work to be done, and the Office of Chief Security Officer, in coordination with the Undersecretary for Intelligence and Analysis and the DHS components, has charted a clear course to further mitigate the concern of the insider threat. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to your questions, sir. Colonel, thank you. Our next witness is Rear Admiral Robert Hayes, who uh, just recently uh, uh, took on the mantle for Coast Guard intelligence activities, assuming the post of Assistant Commandant for Intelligence just earlier this month. Prior to his, uh, this command, Admiral Hayes served as Chief of Plans and Policy for the Assistant Commandant for Intelligence and Criminal Investigations. Prior to that, served as Deputy Director of the Coast Guard's Counterintelligence Service. He graduated from the Coast Guard Academy in 19, uh, 1988 and earned a master's in strategic intelligence from the National Intelligence University in 1993. Admiral Hayes, good to have you here today. Look forward to your testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman King. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Ranking Member Higgins and other distinguished members of the committee. I'm honored to be here today to discuss the Coast Guard's counterintelligence and insider threat programs. It's a pleasure to be alongside my Department of Homeland Security colleagues, Under Secretary Taylor and Chief Security Officer McComb. And I echo Under Secretary Taylor's assessment of the range of intelligence collection threats that face the Department and the Coast Guard. As the world's premier multi-mission maritime service responsible for the safety, security, and stewardship of the nation's waters, the Coast Guard offers a unique and enduring value proposition to the Department of Homeland Security and the American public. At all times, a military service and branch of the armed forces, a federal law enforcement agency, a regulatory body, a first responder, and a member of the U.S. intelligence community, the Coast Guard is under high demand as a global instrument of national security. One of the key elements of the Coast Guard's intelligence enterprise is our counterintelligence program. In 2004, the Coast Guard began the initial development 
of its counterintelligence capability. In the early stages of development, counterintelligence activities were primarily defensive in nature, providing support to Coast Guard personnel and units either hosting foreign visitors or traveling overseas. Given the Coast Guard's extensive international engagement with maritime stakeholders, establishing counterintelligence capability was crucial to the protecting Coast Guard personnel from foreign intelligence collection attempts and served as the cornerstone for further development of other counterintelligence activities. Today, the Coast Guard's counterintelligence service protects our work workforce through detection, deterrence, and neutralization of foreign intelligence threats by leveraging authorities and capabilities to provide the full spectrum of counterintelligence support. We do this through many activities, including counterintelligence investigations, operations, collections, and analysis. And these activities shield Coast Guard operations, personnel, systems, facilities, and information from the intelligence activities of not only foreign powers, but terrorist groups and criminal organizations, as Undersecretary Taylor mentioned. In addition to the counterintelligence mission, the counterintelligence service manages and executes the Coast Guard's insider threat program, which began formally addressing insider threats in 2008. In 2012, the Coast Guard officially chartered an insider threat working group. The counterintelligence service staffed a small team to address insider threat requirements and began installation of activity monitoring technologies designed to detect insider threats on classified computer systems. Additionally, the director of the Coast Guard Counterintelligence Service was appointed as the senior official for the Coast Guard Insider Threat Program. A National Insider Threat Task Force assessment of the Coast Guard's Insider Threat Program resulted in the Coast Guard becoming the first Insider Threat Program in the executive branch to achieve full operating capability earlier this year. The National Insider Threat Task Force also refers to the Coast Guard's Inside Threat Program as the gold standard for small organizations. The Coast Guard's Insider Threat Program has transitioned from seeking help from partner agencies to providing it. We have advised the Department of Defense on the conduct of technical insider threat detection on classified computer systems at sea. We've compared and contrasted best practices with other departments, and we've provided best practices to executive branch agencies as well as some combatant commands. Our technical detection capability, which is staffed by engineers and analysts, spans all classified Coast Guard computer systems and its continuous oversight from Coast Guard leadership and legal counsel. Since inception, we have identified or supported the detection of multiple threats. The overwhelming majority of these detections have been non-malicious types of unauthorized disclosures, password sharing, and system administrator privilege abuse. Despite the absence of harmful attacks, we must remain vigilant to cont by continuing to mature our insider threat and counterintelligence program. Thank you for inviting me to discuss the Coast Guard's counterintelligence and insider threat programs, and I look forward to your questions, sir. Thank you, Admiral. Uh, I'll keep my questions brief prior to the closed session. Uh, Colonel McComb, uh, you know, there's been two very public cases of employees arrested with guns at work in the last month that I mentioned in my opening statement. What's your overall assessment of security at the DHS facilities and your ability to identify insider threats that could pose a physical uh, threat? I think, sir, um, as, as you may or may not know, the DHS headquarters is a, a level five facility. Uh, that is, uh, we meet the standards of the Interagency Security Committee, uh, which is the highest level with regard to federal facilities. Uh, we meet those standards at the uh, DHS headquarters in Nebraska Avenue complex. Uh, and uh, we are implementing enhanced security measures which are above and beyond the basic measures required by, by those standards. Uh, as you alluded to during those, uh, uh, those enhanced security measures, which includes random screening of employees, we did detect individuals that were uh, attempting to bring unauthorized items into the uh, DHS headquarters. Uh, in both instances, uh, we have, we, they're currently under investigation, but in both instances, we have not detected anything that would lead us to believe that these individuals were uh, planning any sort of workplace violence or conspiring with others to commit workplace violence. We take uh, uh, security very seriously. I think we do a, a great job, and I believe our enhanced security measures worked in these cases. Uh, in addition to the enhanced security measures that are being employed, 
uh, at uh, th this location. Uh, we have taken on a, a, a large employee uh, education effort, which includes uh, uh, town hall meetings, uh, communications to the employees to, to understand that they, if they see something unusual, to report it, uh, and including training uh, to include insider threat training and also emergency manager training for how to respond in certain cases. So the, uh, the department is very committed to uh, ensuring that folks are protected within our headquarters and the DHS complex at ne Nebraska Avenue complex is no exception to that rule, sir. Thank you, and I'll, I guess I'll ask this across the uh, board. Is there a renewed sense of urgency in the department and the administration to expedite the implementation of continuous evaluation programs in the wake of the OPM breach? Sir, the, uh, the uh, DNI, the Director of National Intelligence, has the lead for the continuous evaluation. Uh, uh, as you uh, may or may not know, that, that program will be automated. It is yet to happen. But when it does, there will be uh, seven authoritative databases that individuals that have national security determinations or possess secret or, or above clearances uh, will, will be uh, vetted against those either on a daily basis or monthly basis, depending upon the particular database. Uh, and once those, uh, if an individual indicates a hit from one of those databases, then uh, the Department of Homeland Security, along with all the other departments who participate in this program, uh, will be required to follow that lead, uh, vet that individual, and determine whether it has implication on their ability to perform their job and or have access to national security information. There is a timeline that 5% of the tier five, that is those with TSSEI clearances, must be in a continuous evaluation program by September of 2017. We in DHS have already initiated the, the work to ensure that our IT systems allow us to receive those alerts from the DNI automated program. And we have, will do a pilot program this year uh, to start doing some of those continuous evaluations on our once again, most sensitive population, those with TSSEI clearances. Anybody else want to comment on that? Okay, thank you. Uh, Ranking Member, Mr. Higgins. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Taylor, I just you know, want to continue this uh, line of questioning on the issue of uh, Homeland Security and headquarters. Uh, for the second time in a month, an employee has been arrested for taking a handgun uh, onto the secured grounds of the Department of Homeland Security at uh, their headquarters here in Washington, D.C. Uh, according to police records, uh, the accused had a 9 millimeter handgun and a leather handbag while inside the complex. Uh, the accused is a contractor who works in the uh, information technology uh, for the agency. Uh, the weapon appeared to be fully functional, uh, capable of being fired by a single hand and designed to expel a projectile uh, by the action of an explosive. Um, this arrest comes about a month after the arrest of another individual, another Homeland Security employee accused of carrying a firearm inside agency headquarters. Uh, court filings from the investigators uh, indicated that uh, the accused, uh, the second individual, uh, was found with a loaded 22 caliber handgun carrying five hollow point bullets in June. Um, in that same court filing, it said that the agent uh, was, and I quote, uh, probable cause to believe that the accused was conspiring with another to commit workforce violence and more particularly may have been conspiring or planning to commit violence against a senior DHS official in the building. What can you tell us? Sir, I, I will ask uh, CSO McComb to uh, comment further, but uh, I believe it probably most appropriate to do this in the closed session as opposed to a, uh, this open session uh, to respond to that question. Sir, what I would indicate is that, uh, as you stated, you're, you're correct in that there were two individuals that were discovered during our random screening processes as part of our enhanced security measures at the Nebraska Avenue complex were discovered with uh, weapons. Uh, the investigation is ongoing, but uh, as I indicated earlier, at this point, 
uh, there's, there's no indication that either of these individuals were planning or conspiring to commit workplace violence. Uh, both of these individuals uh, obviously uh, had been previously cleared and uh, as, uh, as the Undersecretary Taylor indicated, uh, would certainly be happy to provide more details of both of those events in the closed session. Uh, Ms. Katko, gentleman from New York. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, General, it's good to see you again, Colonel McComb and uh, Ad Rear Admiral Hayes. Uh, quick question for you. Uh, I, as you may know, I think you know, I have uh, direct oversight over the Transportation Security Administration through my subcommittee. And is it fair to say that uh, in your capacities, uh, General and, and Colonel, that you, you consult with TSA on a regular basis regarding intelligence matters and security matters? Yes, sir, that's correct, every oh, day. Okay, great. So I, just a couple of quick questions with respect to the, the, the um, insider threat at um, TSA facilities and airports. Um, I, I know you're well aware of the incident about a year and a half ago where a fellow got off the uh, plane in LaGuardia Airport with a backpack full of guns, and it turned out that an employee from an, at the airport in Atlanta had carried those backpacks through the secure area using a CIDA badge and uh, gave the backpack to the fellow and he brought it up to New York. It turns out that was about his 10th trip and uh, the backpack in question had 16 guns, uh, nine millimeters in assault rifles, most of which were loaded. Obviously that's a major uh, concern about the insider threat from employees at airports. There's also more recently uh, the insider threat at airports manifested with the Dallas-Fort Worth incident in a major drug trafficking case which in the public record included um, invitations by one of the employees at the airport to uh, bring anything through the, the access control areas, including bombs, if people wanted to. And with the threat from ISIS being what it is, uh, and their desire to take down planes, and taking credit for two planes that have been bombed in the last eight months, and perhaps even a third with Egypt Air, we don't know yet. Uh, it's a real, very real concern for me, and it's something that I, I can't, can't get over, uh, and I will continue to pursue. And the concerns are manifested for this hearing in two ways. One is uh, uh, the safety and security of the airports in the United States and the safety and security of the last point of departure airports worldwide. And uh, with respect to the, the safety and security of the airports in the United States, um, are you aware of any changes and procedures that have been undertaken by TSA and or uh, Homeland Security with respect to the vetting of employees at airports, not just TSA employees, but vetting of employees at airports to ensuring uh, that the insider threat is minimized? And number two, uh, what do you think about beefing up the access controls uh, for those employees? Thank you for your question, uh, Congressman. Uh, some of this we would probably want to discuss in the closed hearing uh, because of the sensitive nature of it. But uh, since the event in Atlanta, uh, TSA has been working uh, with the airport authorities uh, and the federal security directors to tighten up uh, significantly the security in the sterile area, uh, particularly for uh, employees that uh, have access under sight of badges. And we can speak to you about how those changes have occurred over time. We are very much concerned uh, of, about security in the, uh, in the open area, in the, before the security, secure and sterile area. Uh, and we have communicated with uh, airport operators uh, and our for, uh, federal security directors uh, continuously since, uh, since its stumble about that concern. And uh, we issued a joint NCT, NCTC, FBI, DHS uh, joint intelligence bulletin around tactics, techniques, and procedures that we uh, noted from Istanbul that we think will be valuable in planning security uh, in the um, public areas of the airport. It is a huge problem. Uh, we recognize that and we'll be consulting uh, in the next month uh, across the industry in terms of best practices for keeping the area open and welcoming, but also providing the layers of security that are necessary to um, uh, protect the public that's there. Colonel, want to add anything, or does that adequate cover it? Uh, the, the only thing I would add, sir, is that uh, the, the TSA does have a robust insider threat program. Um, as we'll uh, talk in more detail uh, in, the, in the closed session, 
uh, they are very concerned about the areas that you discussed, and uh, that will be, uh, you know, a, a very prominent part of what they monitor as we continue to roll out and mature the insider threat program within the, depart uh, the uh, Department of Homeland Security. If the chairman will just indulge me one more moment. Thank you. Uh, just switching gears briefly, uh, I'm vitally concerned about uh, a developing uh, uh, facts with respect to opening the airports in Cuba. Uh, my concern is, quite frankly, that we're sprinting to the finish line, but not knowing, sprinting to the starting line, but we're not know where the finish line is. And uh, it, I think it's a recipe for disaster. And one of the biggest concerns I have is the insider threat at, at the airports in Cuba um, and the lack of appropriate facilities for those airports. And uh, we've, you, I, the Homeland Security Committee, I'm, Homeland Security, I know, is well aware of my concerns, but I just want to state them again on the record, Colonel in general, it is incredibly important that we do a thorough job evaluating those airports before we open up those routes. I know everyone's licking their chops from a financial standpoint, and I know there may be some pressure from the administration because uh, the, the, the president wants this done before he leaves office, but I urge you in the strongest words possible, based on everything I know, and we can talk more about that in a secure setting, that it is a very serious security issue. Uh, and one thing I can say in the public record is when you don't even know um, how the Cuban officials uh, screen their employees, and they won't tell you how they do it, and you don't know such basic things as that, I would, I would strongly urge you that if you really are serious about the insider threat and you're very serious about keeping that sky safe, that you, take, you look at it with a very focused eye on what's going on in Cuba before you open up those airports with 20 direct flights a day to New York and possibly direct flights to Washington, which are the two main targets for terrorists. Yes, sir, and I think we can... Uh have a further discussion in, in the closed session about the, um, those challenges with those airports. But uh, uh, for the record, uh, DHS takes uh, aviation security very seriously, particularly any aviation operating directly into the United States. We recognize the risk and uh, want to make sure we have done a thorough job of uh, assessing both the security at the airport and security of the aircraft uh, before they arrive here. Thank you very much. I yield back. Chairman Yields, the gentlelady from Texas is recognized for five minutes. I thank the chairman and the ranking member for this uh, combined uh, committee and thank the witnesses as well for um, your presence here today. Uh, let me um, say that. Um, in the backdrop of the memorial yesterday that I attended in my home state for the fallen officers, let me again offer my deepest sympathy to the uh, Dallas uh, Police Department and um, to families uh, who uh, are lost, uh, who have lost loved ones uh, through actions of terror and certainly um, through uh, recent incidences uh, in our nation that have befallen many families uh, from many different states and jurisdictions. That um, the climate that we're in uh, calls for great attention. Uh, maybe as we speak, we're not pointedly talking about um, the immediacy of a loss of life, but cybersecurity and intrusion can certainly bring about uh, cybersecurity incidences and uh, intrusion to places where individuals should not go can certainly uh, bring about enormous uh, amount of danger and, uh, and possible injury and death. Um, I'd like to put into the record, I'm not sure if this is in the record, another employee with a gun arrested at Homeland Security Headquarters, a man caught during random employee screening. I'd ask unanimous consent to put this into the record. Right. Uh, we've already discussed that, but right. no okay. objection. All right. Uh, put the story at least into the wreck. And the reason why I say that is uh, because um, there are a number of intrusions that I'm concerned about, and I want to discuss some legislation that I've introduced as well. But let me uh, pointedly go to two uh, entities, uh, nations that are known as our chief threats to intelligent assets of the United States. And this would be... Uh, to uh, you, uh, Mr. Secretary, Secretary Taylor, um, how can Russia or China, um, with the OPM breach data, or use the OPM breach data, 
with the Ashley Madison breach information to compromise security. Ma'am, I, uh, I would prefer we respond to that question uh, in, a, in the closed session. Uh, I think we can be more uh, full in our answer. Uh, the threat from cybersecurity is a significant threat, and the information and data that's collected through cybersecurity means or cyber intrusion means uh, present a significant uh, uh, threat to our country. Uh, but the specifics, I would prefer if we could answer that in the in the closed session. Okay, so let me, um, well, let me just get a uh, general assessment then, because I'm not sure when we will designate a closed session, so let me try Right after this, as soon as you're finished, we're going downstairs. <laughs> okay, um, then let me just uh, make my own comments and say the great concern that I have of that data being out um, is what I hope that we will have a focused perspective on, and I assume that you can answer, we'll have a focused effort on that. We have a 110% focus effort on that, uh, that activity and the potential implications of that activity uh, for the national security. Very good. Let me um, then go to some legislation that I think had to do um, or reflects the um, shooter that was at the Navy Yard and the Snowden, as I understand, um, they were vetted for security by the same contractor. Um, are you able to comment on any firewalls that are being put on outside contractors, any um, uh, extensive review on contractors who have responsibilities for vetting uh, and uh, where the government relies upon them? Are, they, um, are these contracts um, periodic? Do people get 10-year contracts? Are these people uh, wedded in their positions, can't be taken out? Are they lax? What is happening? Um, I think that Snowden has to be one of the most severe and outrageous um, uh, responses or actions that we had in security, and he was vetted, and he was engaged in, I think, uh, at too high a level of the nation's uh, security data intelligence data. Ma'am, uh, uh, kind of uh, bottom line up front is that uh, the vetting of contractors and, and the companies that have contractors are, are uh, done in accordance with the federal investigative standards. And uh, uh, at the uh, interagency level, the uh, Performance Accountability Council for Security, uh, Suitability, Security Clearances, and Credentialing is, is looking at that issue very hard. Uh, all of uh, the uh, companies who, uh, who are on classified contracts must meet uh, the, the National Industrial Security Program standards, which requires that they, uh, they have a, a facility security officer they, they run through the background investigations uh, of the individuals who will be working those contracts, whether they be for investigative purposes or if they're doing some other level of work, whether it be on the IT systems, et cetera. Uh, we in DHS look at those contractors from a fitness perspective, uh, once again applying the OPM standards. So we look at that very hard. Con uh, contracts are, are, are held to the standards that are in the performance work statement. Uh, where there are issues or breaches of those, uh, then uh, contracting action can be taken against those individuals, uh, to, uh, those companies to include termination on behalf of the government uh, based on, on those breaches. Uh, uh, we uh, continue to monitor that uh, along with the uh, contracting uh, folks. And the other thing I would add is with the cyber hygiene uh, initiative in the Department of Homeland Security, uh, we are ensuring that all information that is handled through contracts is kept at the high um, security uh, level, uh, to, which is above the, the standard required for the, uh, uh, the, uh, the federal government and, and to ensure that it is protected at the appropriate levels and that uh, it is not uh, potentially endangered uh, for uh, unauthorized access. Can I just get a quick follow-up, Mr. Chairman, just very quickly. Mr. Snowden was lodged somewhere in the back corners of a Hawaii office building. Is there, do you have the responsibility, and you are one of the intelligence components, I understand that, 
but the monitoring, you may have the company and then you have these individual actors under the company, maybe many. Is there a mode of monitoring those individuals? Lastly, if our cyber system is attacked, meaning what we utilize here in the government, um, are we prepared, and that may be an answer, for a backup system somewhere? Ma'am, I'll try to answer your question. Uh, first, our insider threat monitoring will monitor everyone that has access to uh, our classified systems, a contractor, government employee, regardless, uh, and ultimately uh, individuals that uh, are operating on our unclassified system that may or may not have a uh, security clearance. Um, Cyber hygiene has been a real focus of Secretary Johnson with regard to applying the uh, National Programs Division uh, cybersecurity initiatives across our government uh, and <clears throat> ensuring that they are robustly applied and uh, effectively implemented. So it has been a, a, a major focus for us. Uh, I can't speak to the, uh, the issue of, of backup. I'm not technically qualified to, to understand that system, but would certainly uh, find the answer to that question for you and get back to you, ma'am. I appreciate it. Thank you. May I? Did, did you want to answer? Or? No, ma'am. All right. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I ask you, now, thank you, thank you all for your testimony. May, may I ask, because I, I won't pursue the backup system Maybe I'll get that at another, another time. Yeah. Um, You'll have to start going downstairs. So. Yes. Uh, let me uh, ask unanimous consent to put in the record Bloomberg News, Edward Snowden, and the NSA a lesson about insider threats. I ask unanimous consent. Without objection. I yield back. Okay. Uh, I ask unanimous consent that the remainder of the hearing be closed to the public under House Rule 11, Clause 2G2, because disclosure of testimony, evidence, or other matters would endanger national security or compromise sensitive law enforcement information. Is there any objection to the motion to close the hearing? Hearing none, the motion is agreed to, and the subcommittee will recess briefly to move to a more secure location to continue its business. The hearing will reconvene at that location in 15 minutes.